I was at the hospital uh, a week or so ago, and, and as I visited there, I was having a conversation. Um, one of the ladies there at the hospital, uh, she said, you know what? I, I don't know why the, the issue came up. I, I can't remember the exact details of the conversation, but, but somebody mentioned, you know, the, the need for patience. And so this, this lady said, I never, pay, I never pray for patience. And um, I don't even know if I had to ask, well, why? But I was thinking, well, why? But she just came on out with it. Because you know what happens when you pray for patience. God will put something in your life to, to cause you to have to learn that valuable lesson. I'm not sure that's the right approach. And, and, you know, for all I know, it's probably some preacher she heard before said, well, if you pray for patience, you ought to expect, you know, and maybe that's, maybe that's on some preacher that, that uh, maybe shouldn't have said that the way he did. That, that, because should we really ever be scared to pray for something that we need? I mean, God's inviting us to pray and ask for his help from the very beginning in chapter 1 James says if you lack wisdom what do you do you ask the Lord you ask God you pray that God will give you wisdom so one of the things one of the characteristics of the Christian life is living with in wisdom but another characteristic of of a, a maturing believer is Yes, you guessed it. Patience. So, what do you do to exercise patience? That's going to be our question for the day. In our text, we're going to pick up there with James chapter 5, where we left off last week with verse 6. We're going to pick up here then in verse 7. And right off the bat... We get an imperative. Now remember what our imperatives are. They're commands. They're not optional, right? So by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, James is writing these words to the believers of the first century and through all the centuries now down to us. And God says to us two words. Be patient. Well, let's go ahead and read the rest of it so we can get all the context. Now, speaking of context, don't forget that the preceding passage, from verses 1 down through 6, was about these wealthy unbelievers who in all likelihood were the ones causing the persecution on the saints. The believers, the, the suffering of these saints was in all likelihood at the hands of those wealthy folks that, that James was talking to in verses 1 through 6. So in light of that, James is saying, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth, for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. So what is James saying to us here? Okay, be patient. And how long should we be patient again? It's kind of like when, when the disciples were, were uh, talking about forgiveness and they said, now, now, Lord, you've been talking about this forgiveness stuff. Now, how many times do we got to forgive? You know, Because, you know, there's some people that have done some stuff to me. And I understand I need to forgive. But, man, this, this is just, you know, going on too far. How many times should I forgive? Mm, let's say 70 times 7. Now, everybody who lived at that time understood that was a way of saying not 490 times. But infinitely, there, there is no end. You don't stop offering forgiveness. 
in the same way, that's what James is saying here. When do you stop being patient? Well, let's say till the Lord comes. Well, how long is that? Till the Lord comes. So again, how long do I need to be patient? You know, until he comes or takes you home. Either, either way, and you go see him, you can stop being patient then. Okay, are we clear on that? So, so how long do we need to be patient? Until the Lord comes or calls me home. But now, the difficulty is, okay, I understand how long I need to be patient, but how do I be patient? <laughs> right? I mean, it's one thing to know I need to do that, and it's another thing I need to know how long I should do it, but how do I do it? I need some help here, Lord. You're asking me, you're commanding me to be patient. You're expecting me to be patient. Oh, Lord, how do I do that? I'm glad you asked. Because that, that's what James is going to say here to us. He's going to give us some ways to, to help us uh, express and, and live out and exercise patience. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Look at verse 8. So if in verse 7 the command is to be patient, and to be patient until Jesus comes, just like a farmer has to be patient waiting for, for the rains to come and, and water his crops, knowing that one day the fruit will come, the harvest will come, in the same way, verse 8, be ye also patient. When he repeats it twice, <laughs> you better listen up, right? So be ye also patient, just like the farmer's patient, waiting for the crop to come. What, when is the crop coming? Well, in our case, when, when, is, when is the great harvest? When Jesus comes and we get to go be with him. So like the farmer... We need to be patient, but how do we do that? Well, number one, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Another way to say establish your heart, you could, in, in the King James, establish and where they can't, where the E came from that we use today, establish, who knows, but that's what the word is now, establish, not establish. But what does that mean, to establish your heart? That just sounds kind of weird. I've got a heart. I'm going to establish it. What does that mean? The word in the original is to, uh, to, to make something steadfast, to, to stand your ground. In other words, to drive a stake down right here, to set your heart. Does that make sense? Does that make a little better sense? Set your heart. How does that help me with patience? To set my heart. It depends on where you set your heart. If you set your heart on, on uh, sinking sand, what's going to happen with that? You know, th th there's no solid foundation to set the stake. But if you set your heart on the sure foundation that's the rock of Jesus Christ, you've got something to drive that stake down. You can set your heart. You can say, this is where I stand and I will not move. I stand in Christ alone. I stand in His Word. I stand on His promises. And you set your heart there. And when you do that, guess what? You can be patient with a whole lot of things. Because when you set your mind in the Word of God on the sure foundation of Jesus, Jesus says, you don't have to worry. Why are we so impatient all the time? Because we're worrying about stuff. We worry about the future, so we're impatient. We worry about you know, what's going to happen to us or what's going to happen to our loved ones. We were, and we're impatient. And Jesus said, if you, 
if you lay up treasure, we talked about this last week with these, these wealthy people and where they were laying up treasure. If you lay up your treasure in, in heaven where rust and moth you can't destroy it, if that's where your heart is, Matthew 6, 33, then God will take care of the rest. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You don't have to worry. That was the context where Jesus says, don't worry. So, how can we exercise patience? Set your mind. Establish your hearts. And, and what do we establish it on? For the, or, or why do we establish it? For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. He just said, how long should you be patient? Till he comes. So, set your heart until he comes because guess what? He's coming. Now, when is he coming? I don't know. You don't either. So how long do you do it? Until he comes. And why do we do it? Because we know he is coming. We know he's coming. So set your heart in his word. Set your heart to to live according to the promises of God. And then trust him for the rest. He'll take care of it. He promises he will, and he has never, never let anyone down on his promise. Now, that's kind of like step one. We've got to set our heart. So set your heart if if you want to learn how to be patient. But but here's another thing. Look at verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 9. Verse 9, or I'm sorry, verse 8 is a positive. Remember, sometimes James likes to do these negatives and positives. A positive is this is something to do. Be patient. But the negative is when you find a not. Don't be this. Do be that, patient. Do be this, set your mind. Don't be that. Well, what is the don't be in in verse uh, 9? Grudge not one against another. So, uh, so what is our word here? Um, set your heart, but, but stop grumbling. Another word here for, for grudging, is being grudging towards someone, is it, kind of having a grumbling, complaining heart. Now, we talked about that, that complaining heart back in, in, uh, in, in chapter 4, didn't we? we? He said, stop speaking evil. Speak no evil. Remember that from chapter 4? And we talked at length about... Stop complaining. And, and so James is bringing that back up again here, saying, listen, if you want to be patient, remember what I've already told you. Set your heart and then stop grumbling. Because what do you have to complain about if your heart is set in Christ? And, he's, and you know he's going to take care of the rest because you've made him your first priority of life. So he says, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. What happens is, we decide something's not going our way. So we're impatient. And when we get impatient, what do we start doing? We start talking, complaining, grumbling. And you know what we're doing? Because God is sovereign, is He not? What we're doing is we're saying, God, you don't have this under control. God, you're not really, how can I say this, Lord? You're not doing the job. So let me take your spot here for a minute because I know better than you do how to live this life and I know how to fix this problem and I'm impatient. And I don't want to wait for your solution. I think I can handle this on my own. And you know what? That fruit looks really good. And I think I'll just take a bite. Because I want the knowledge of good and evil so that I can really kind of take your spot. Because, you know, I kind of know better than you do anyway. In all these eons, it's never changed from the garden till now. We want to be God. 
And that's the problem. And so we get impatient. And we start complaining. We start grumbling about situations. We start grumbling about people. We don't like this. We don't like that. Is it really about you? Or is it about a sovereign God who is working in people's lives? And here's the thing. The person you're grumbling about, maybe even the, the, the people that were taking advantage of, of the saints, of the believers, those wealthy folks that, that James was talking about in the, in the first six verses, maybe they're, they're a problem. Maybe they're really persecuting you. Maybe there's somebody in your life that's just coming down on you and, and you've just had enough. And you Lord, how long do I have to be patient with this? And why should I have to be patient with it? You don't know what God's doing in their lives. And you don't know how they're watching your reaction to know if this Christian life is really real or not. Sometimes, you know what people do? They'll just pour on the heat to see if you're really real. Sometimes they'll pour on the heat testing Christianity. Say, does it really work? I want to know, is, is Christianity really real? You prove it to me. You live it out. And I'm going to pour up the heat and see how you act. Now, sometimes people do that. Sometimes the Lord allows things in our lives like he did in the lives of the prophets and the Job. Look at the example. For example, verse 10, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Not just those prophets who spoke God's word and were often criticized, ridiculed, thrown in prison. I mean, just read through Lamentations, you know, a little bit. And now you, you want to get depressed. Now, you know, God's word is not designed to depress us, but, but you can see a prophet of God, Jeremiah, going through the, the, the depression that overtook his life because he... He got so caught up in the fact that he's preaching and teaching God's word, delivering the, the message of God, and, and, and the kings are coming down on him, throwing him in jail, putting him in, in the stockade, and all these bad things are happening in his life. And he's like, God, I wish I just didn't exist. You remember Elijah? Elijah runs from Jezebel because she's put a bounty out on his head. And he said, God, just take my life. I'm the only one left. And you remember that still small voice comes and says, oh, no, you're not. I still got 7,000 who have not bowed down to Baal. But we get caught up in those things. We get, we get emotional, and, and we, get, uh, we start looking around and saying, you know what, God, just this isn't working out. Your plan it, it isn't really all that great. And God says, oh, really? Kind of like Job. What happened in Job's life? Let's look at verse 11. Behold, we count them happy. Now, maybe a better translation of that word would be blessed. Because happiness, at least in, in our understanding of it today, is, is kind of, a, of an emotional thing. You know, happy-go-lucky, where we're, we're happy. But, but there's a depth to this word in the original language that has more to do with, with being blessed. Whether we're just, you know, walking around with a happy smile on our face or not, we understand we're being blessed by God. And that's the word here in the original language. So you, we could say, behold, we count them blessed, which endured. We look back on their lives, and it doesn't look real happy sometimes for Jeremiah. It didn't look real happy sometimes for, for uh, Elijah. But we know God blessed them beyond measure, don't we? We could see in the end how God blessed them. Think about Job, for example. You've heard of the patience of Job, verse 11 says. And you've seen the end of the Lord. You've seen the end product of what God did in his life. That's what that phrase means. That the Lord is very pitiful. Now, pitiful, this word means compassionate. God's not pitiful. Oh, pitiful God. That's not what the word says. That's why we have modern translations to help us out with some of these words that don't mean the same thing that they did 400 years ago. 
So uh, the word pitiful does not apply to God. In, in our modern language, what we would say is compassion. God is compassionate. He has pity on us and of tender mercy. So what do we know about Job and the patience of, of Job? God allowed Satan to attack this man. I mean, a, a, a full-out assault on the life of Job from Satan. And he had permission from God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't ever <laughs> say, God, please, please don't give that kind of permission to Satan to do what he... But it's God's prerogative. God is sovereign. I'm not. If he chooses to test me, then who am I? As uh, Jeremiah said, I'm just the clay. He's the potter. So who, who, is the, who is the clay to say to the potter, why have you made me thus? So sometimes we go through suffering and trials and tribulation in life. Again, all the way back to chapter 1 in James, because God is testing us. And he is moving and, and, and working in our lives to make us something that we weren't. To make us something better than we were before. To, yes, teach us how to be patient by allowing some things in life that will test that patience. So, what do you do to exercise patience? You set your heart on the things of God. What do you do? You stop complaining about everything else and everybody else. Stop grumbling. But what's another thing that we need to do? And this, this is in verse 12, and we'll, we'll finish with this. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest you fall into condemnation. What do we do? We say what we mean, and we mean what we say. In other words, keep your word. Well, what does that have to do with, with, with being patient? Here's what happens. Sometimes we get impatient and we say things that we should not have said. We do things we should not have done. We make promises we should never have made. Ever been there? But you know what? God doesn't excuse your promise because you said it in haste. God's Word says that if you make an oath, you're obligated to keep that oath. It doesn't matter if you said it in haste or not. God expects you to keep your word. God expects you to keep your word to Him. God expects you to keep your word to your spouse. God expects you to keep your promises when you sign on the dotted line and you make a business contract. God expects you to fulfill your commitment to the church. This is a commitment. We have engaged in, in a covenant relationship when you join the body of Christ the local church you're making a commitment of your life to work in God's kingdom in this place to do all he's called you to do to, to fit in here to be the arm or the leg or, or the ear or the eyes as a uh, Paul talked about over in Corinthians 12, all the various parts of the body. That, that's you. You're, you're part of it. And you've made a commitment to fulfill your part of, of God's plan for this body. So live up to it. Be part of the body in every way that you can. It, it goes to our patience. 
because we want the wisdom not to make hasty promises so we need to be patient we need to think through and we need to consider we need to ask God's wisdom before you make a promise because God will hold you accountable to it right here in the word so how do we exercise patience I'm glad you asked now you know set your heart stop the grumbling from playing and just say what you mean and mean what you say simple as that it isn't God's word just so it's just common sense but Lord how often we just don't even you know we just don't do it but it's common sense it's God's way and it's the right way to be patient and how long do we need to be patient again till he comes how long is that till he comes all right well let's uh let's bow for a moment